so many people hanging and kissing. <laughs> okay, so I'm here to introduce you our first plenarist today, JJ Wilson. JJ Amaro Wilson is a German born Anglo Nigerian American writer and teacher trainer. He is author or co author of 20 books about language and language learning, two of which won awards that saw him honored at the Buckingham Palace in 2008 and 2011. His textbooks in this field have sold half a million of copies. Hamor Wilson's fiction, essays, and poetry have been published in numerous literary magazines and anthologies in the UK and the US. His 2016 novel, Damnificados, which I've read it, <laughs> won three international awards and was named a top 10 book in O, the Oprah magazine. It has since been translated into French and German, and his most recent novel is Nazare from 2021. His plays have been produced in, on four continents, most recently in Gaza, Palestine, and he was elected to the Academy of American Poets in 2016. Amoros Wilson is the writer in residence at Western New Mexico University, USA, and was the inaugural editorial director of Members Press of Western New Mexico University. He has lived in 11 countries and visited 70. We saw J.J. Wilson at least twice in two different conferences, and we were delighted with his talks. I ran and bought his book, Damnificados. <laughs> I offered that book to Alberto, too. <laughs> so we asked the immediately to, we invited him to come to our conference. It, this was two years ago. So we are really glad to have JJ here in our opening session at the API conference. So it's a pleasure to welcoming him and a big round of applause to JJ. Bom dia. Oh yes, and he speaks Portuguese. No, no, no falo Portuguese. <laughs> Que prazer para mim estar aqui com vocês um, depois de dois anos de Covid e tudo. Um, muito obrigado. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, parabéns, Sonia, Alberto and the team. Um, and I hope we're all going to have a wonderful, wonderful conference. Um, I haven't done this for three years, spoken in front of a, a live ELT audience. So I'm, I'm kind of, it's like going back to my roots and I've kind of forgotten how to do it. And it reminds me of um, the very first time I was invited to give a, a plenary. A close friend of mine who is a, a very experienced speaker, he said to me, JJ, are you nervous? And I said, no, I'm okay. And he said, well, remember this. Don't try to be witty, charming, or intelligent. Just be yourself. <laughs> I said, thank you very much. How kind. Anyway. Um, Thank you for that wonderful introduction. The, the introduction is like a highlights reel of your professional life. You, you sound so amazing. So I thought I'd start by um, telling you about a time when I was a complete failure and a, a complete disaster. Uh, obviously, as, as a teacher and a writer, we, we live with failure all the time, don't we? We, we teach things rather badly or or in terms of writing, we write really bad stuff and have to just throw it away. So anyway, I'm going to tell you about when I was a young, idealistic teacher working in the north of Italy. And I was teaching in a language school, and it was very conservative. Um, everyone was dressed as if they were going to a cocktail party. And, and you had to, there were lots of rules in this school, and you had to follow the book and the exercises perfectly. So it's very, very conservative. And the students, they were compliant, but they weren't very engaged. And the difference is compliant students answer your questions, engaged students ask their own questions. 
So all my students, they were very obedient, but they weren't really... Anyway, in order to prevent myself from dying of boredom, I started introducing things like drama, art, music, film clips, games, and all these fun things into the class. Because I also thought that they would learn better through, through these methods. And the students were generally okay with it, but the problem was my director of studies did not approve of these, these methods. Now, in the classroom, we, we had a, there was a door, well, there's a door in every classroom, isn't there? But there, there was a door, and there was a little window at the top of the door, and I would see her while I was teaching. She would walk by, and she would look through the window, and she would be frowning at me. And I knew exactly what she was thinking. She was thinking, what's he doing? Why are the students moving? Why are they talking? Why isn't the teacher giving his lecture? And is that music I hear? <laughs> it, was, it was like teaching for the Taliban, you know? There was no, no music allowed, no art, no drama, no poetry. Anyway, sure enough, I got a call, I got a message to go and see the director of studies at the end of one school day. And I, I knew exactly what was going to happen. So I, I went to her room. She had this very strange office, a huge room, very high ceilings, um, an enormous thick wooden door which she locked from the inside. So I, I knocked on her door and she, um, she opened the latches whoosh, 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 and let me in. This huge door. Then she went and sat back on her throne and I remember actually saying something like, you wish to see me, ma'am? It, it was like something out of Charles Dickens. And she just said to me, in her very strong Italian accent, we don't teach like this. Come back again tomorrow and try to teach better. So, I didn't really know what to say to her because I was very young and I didn't really have the, the language or the theory to explain why I was teaching the way I was teaching. And so I just sort of turned around and walked out the door with whoosh, whoosh. That's the sound of my tail between my legs. <laughs> so it was really quite depressing. So that's the story of my great failure, but it, it kind of has a happy ending. So I went home to my apartment in, in Italy and um, that same day a package had arrived and a friend of mine who was a teacher in the United States had sent me a book. Now I needed cheering up so I happily opened this package and I saw the, the book and it was Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire. So it wasn't very cheerful. Anyway. I, I started to read this book and then I really started to read this book and I was consumed by this book. I consumed it in one night. It's quite a short book and I'd never read anything like it. it was, do any of you know it? Yes. Okay, some of you. Um, it's a book about education but it's also a book full of radical ideas, metaphors. It's about philosophy. Uh, and it's very much about social justice in education, which is the, the root of, of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, this book, what it really did, well, let me just show you the front cover. This book gave me the language and the theory to explain why I was teaching the way I was teaching. Now, um, can you just put your hand up if any of you have actually read Pedagogy of the Oppressed? Just, just a few, okay. Um, so let me explain who Paulo Freire was. He was a Brazilian educator. He taught literacy to uh, peasant farm workers in northeast Brazil in the 1950s and 60s. Um, he was a very much a radical in that his belief was that all education is about liberation, is about freedom, and all education begins with love. 
Love of the student, love of the world, love of nature. And of course, love is the same as justice, isn't it? Because justice is what love looks like in public. Uh, he began with what the students brought to the class. Now, they didn't bring literacy, but they brought great knowledge of nature. They brought knowledge of animals, of the weather, of the climate, of the environment, of tools and implements. And he used these key words as the way to begin their education. He started with what the students brought to the class. Now, he was quite successful in his methods. And for that reason, the Brazilian government locked him up. They imprisoned him and then exiled him. Why? Well, what do you do when you empower poor people to read and write? Well, you empower them, don't you? And they can read their rights and they realize they're being oppressed and repressed. And so the government doesn't like this because the government wanted to keep the people quiet and keep them passive. So let me explain a little more about Freire's work. I think the, the radicalness of this book begins with the title. It's pedagogy of the oppressed. It's not for the oppressed, it's of, because they are doing it for themselves. They're doing this pedagogy for themselves. You, you remember the Bob Marley lyric, e emancipate yourself from, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can rule our minds. You remember that? That's, that's what this is all about. Decolonization of the self. Um, he talks about the banking concept of education. It's an idea that the teacher deposits knowledge into your head and the student just takes it out the way you can take out money. And he said, this is not what education is about because education is transformation. Um, he used problem posing. So the students would have to think critically in order to become educated. He used questioning and dialogue. Those were his main three methods. Uh, he also used something called praxis. Praxis is theory and reflection turned into action. I already mentioned education is the practice of freedom. And he brought his students to a state of conscientisation, a critical consciousness, critical awareness of their place in society. I already mentioned education starts from the student's experiences and either reinforces or challenges the status quo. Finally, his final idea, the teacher is a co-learner. The teacher doesn't know everything. The teacher is with the students learning. What Freire does is he takes us back to the roots of education. Everything that I just showed you, none of it's new. None of it's really new. Um, educare, the root of education, means to bring up, to nurture. Also, there's the idea of education as a moral imperative. And a couple of nice quotations. Maya Angelou, the uh, African-American writer, when we know better, we do better. From Krishnamurti, an educator philosopher from India, the man who knows how to split the atom but has no love in his heart becomes a monster. Education also is a way to solve the ills of the world and also a way to escape our circumstances. It's a way out if we're struggling. So I really want to stress that Freire was in a long line of educators stretching back, at least in the Western tradition, to this one. Anyone know who this is? Socrates. A radical educator who used dialogue, he used questioning, and for his pains he was locked up by his government and eventually uh, killed by the government, effectively. Leo Tolstoy. Who's Tolstoy? He's a writer, yes? Before he was a writer, he was a radical educator. Leo Tolstoy came from a very, very wealthy family 
which had huge amounts of land. On the land, there were serfs working. A serf is just one step up from a slave. And what Tolstoy did was he opened up schools for the children of the serfs. But these schools were radical schools. They, um, there was no homework, there was no grading. The children followed their bliss. Do you know that expression, to follow your bliss? They, they did what they loved doing. Uh, later, Tolstoy actually said, the children taught me how to teach. So he was a radical in his time before he became a novelist. He leads directly to Maria Montessori, who I'm sure you'll know. You know Montessori schools, yes? Uh, she began by educating poor children from the slums of Rome. And she realized they needed a very special education to lift them out of poverty. Uh, she links indirectly to this woman, less well-known, Sylvia Ashton Warner, who worked in New Zealand in the middle of the 20th century. Sylvia Ashton Warner taught Maori school children. She was given all these English textbooks to teach with. And they were all about the, the King of England and the Queen of England and drinking cups of tea. The Maori school children had nothing to do with the King and Queen of England. They didn't know what was going on, they didn't care. So she developed her own technique using key words from the Maori children's lives. And what did they know? They knew about nature, they knew about animals, etc. And of course she leads indirectly to the work of Paulo Freire, who also used questioning, dialogue, uh, he used what the students brought uh, from their own lives, he was also persecuted by the state. So you can see all the connections stretching back 2,000 years from Socrates all the way to Paulo Freire's work. Okay, um, as I said before, Freire gave me the theory and the language to talk about why I was teaching the way I was teaching. We as practitioners, as teachers, we have a slightly difficult relationship with theory sometimes. Um, Michael Swan, the great grammarian, he says, theory is when we know everything and nothing works. Practice is when everything works and we don't know why. Well, English language teaching has managed to combine the two. Nothing works and we don't know why. <laughs> but I do know this. If you're a teacher and you have no theory, you're a little bit like those cartoon characters who are running and running and they run off the edge of a cliff and they, their legs are still moving and they look, they look around and then they look down and then they go, ah! Because they have nothing beneath their feet. They have no grounding. So we do need theory to ground ourselves. And that's what Paulo Freire gave me as a young teacher. He gave me some theory to ground myself. So I'm mainly going to be talking about... Um, oh, let me read you this, this quote from uh, one of Tolstoy's students. He said, in Tolstoy's classes, hours passed like minutes. In our pleasures, in our gaiety, in our rapid progress, we soon became as thick as thieves with the Count. We were unhappy without him, and he was unhappy without us. We were inseparable, and only night drew us apart. There was no end to our conversations. Does that sound like you and your students? I do hope so. So, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the work of Freire, but also social justice in the language classroom. First, some questions to address. What is social justice, and what does it have to do with language teaching? And how are we qualified to teach social justice in the classroom? So, I'm going to look at these one by one very quickly. What is social justice? Well, it's contested, isn't it? In some countries, if you're if you're caught criticizing the government, you get locked up, and that's considered just. Um, in some countries, if you're caught stealing something, you get your hand chopped off. That is considered just, but not, not in our country. It's also um, constantly changing the idea of justice. Within living memory, 
Aborigine children in Australia were taken from their own families and they were sent to camps to learn how to become workers for the wealthy elites. That was considered just. Now it's considered a terrible crime. So, it, so justice is changing. It also affects all areas of human life. The most basic physiological needs like breathing, drinking water. Millions of billions of people don't have clean water to drink or clean pure air to breathe. So social justice affects everything. I've tried to come up with the definition, a world which affords individuals and groups fair treatment and an impartial share of the benefits of society. Next question, what does social justice have to do with language teaching? Well, Michael Swan, again, he says, language teaching is teaching language only. We teach the present perfect six times a day until our students fall unconscious. And then we start on the third conditional, just to knock them out. Anyway, I think it depends on your view of an educator's role in society. So if you go back to Socrates and some of the other educators, they have a different view of the educator's role. It's not just about teaching the subject. Also, of course, we model social justice in the classroom. Here's the big question. How are we qualified to teach social justice in the classroom? Well, the answer is we aren't. But it isn't a body of knowledge. It's something we model. It's an approach. It's an approach to materials, to students and how we treat them and all the apparatus of education, rules and norms of classrooms and technology. So I just want to stress that I'm not telling anyone that they need to teach social justice issues in the language classroom, not at all. All I'm doing is throwing some ideas out there and maybe some of you will catch some of them and integrate them into your work if you don't already. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, actually, before I move on, I'm going to talk about a few ideas against proselytizing. I already mentioned Michael said language teaching is teaching language. Um, Julian Edge says avoid teaching out of a religious conversion motivated zeal. Uh, Nick Gadd, in a famous essay, said, avoid that nurturer of souls approach. We are not nurturers of souls. We're not priests. We're teachers. Uh, and Doug Brown also says, students must be free to be themselves, to behave intellectually without coercion from a powerful elite, to cherish their beliefs, traditions, and cultures without the threat of forced change. So having said all that, what might social justice issues in the classroom look like? Are any of you makers of things? Do you make music or do you paint or do you write or do you knit or sew? Put your hand up if you're a maker of things. Wow, it's probably more than half of you. Okay, fantastic. This is really what I'm going to be talking about in the most practical, more practical part of my, my talk today, I'm going to be talking about students making things. Um, and the first type of thing I'm going to talk about is images. So, teachers, you have pen and paper. I'm going to ask you to draw something. Don't panic. No one's going to judge you. What I'd like you to do is just illustrate an issue that you are passionate about, okay? You have one minute just to illustrate an issue you're passionate about.
Okay, your next job is to find a partner who looks particularly intelligent and friendly. <laughs> Done? Your next job is to explain what you illustrated, but also answer this question, how is this issue represented in your work? Okay, and you have two minutes to do this together. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you there. D did anyone have any really interest? Does anyone have an interesting issue that is represented in their work? Would anyone like to volunteer? Any volunteer? Oh, yes. Gardening. You bring gardening into your class. Excellent. Brilliant, thank you. Bringing gardening, she has plants and it's for behavioural things with the students. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes? About archery. How do you use that in class? <laughs> He was teaching Portuguese to a group of 10 delinquents. <laughs> he was coming back from practice, he had his bow in his car. Can you hear? He's started assembly. Oh, you can hear? Okay, okay.
extended the bow. Yeah, the cord, yeah. It's excellent. So he was teaching adjectives, using, using <laughs> brilliant, dangerous, safe, be careful. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Cool. Never thought of that. Interesting. Brilliant. Okay. Um, let me move on quickly. Uh, thank you for volunteering those ideas, gardening and archery. Um, th this is something else I did with a class when I was living in London, uh, connected with images. There was an exhibition of photographs by Sebastien Salgado. I, some of you know his work. Um, and I took them to see this exhibition. Uh, this is a photo of Brazilian mine workers. Um, basically, Salgado went to all the, the troubled spots, the poorest places of the world, and photographed all these incredible pictures um, of famine. Uh, this is, I think this is in Darfur, Darfur um, where there was a, a terrible famine and after a civil war. Um, basically, he, he just takes these amazing photos of all the, the developing countries and all the struggles. And I got my students just to take notes on what they saw, just to write in English. Then when we went back to the classroom, uh, they each chose a theme. So for example, inequality or working in a mine or famine, etc. And they had to research the theme and give a short presentation on one of those themes. And um, I just remember the, the students kind of having their eyes opened to what the world was like. I happened to be teaching a group of Swiss bankers who'd never really encountered any of these issues before in, in Zurich, in, in, in Switzerland. Um, and I remember one of them saying to me, it was a very powerful learning experience for him, not only learning the language, but also learning about the world, learning about these issues. Okay. Another activity I've done, I've done this a lot with teacher trainers and, and uh, teachers, is classrooms around the world. So the first thing you're going to do is look at these pictures and with your friendly, intelligent partner, you're going to guess which country are these pictures from. And unlike George W. Bush, I expect you to know that Africa is not a country. <laughs> okay. So just tell a partner, where do you think these pictures are? I know you're guessing. So the one on the top left, top left, where do you think? Don't say Africa. It's the Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire. The one below it, all the women on their knees, where do you think that is? Afghanistan. It's probably not allowed now, actually, with the Taliban. Top right, make a guess. Top right is Vietnam. Bottom right, Brazil. How did you guess? Okay, same thing with these ones. Okay, same thing. Top left is Pakistan. You, you see that man sitting in the chair? He started this school for homeless kids on the street. Amazing thing he did. What about the one below it? Make a guess. Morocco. Top right. Siberia? <laughs> 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 Kenya. It's in Kenya. Uh, bottom right, make a guess. It's in Latin America somewhere. It's Colombia. Yeah, it's in Colombia. Okay, next thing you're going to do, again with your friendly intelligent partner, you're going to make sentences, you don't have to write them, just say them, that begin with, I wonder. So for example, I wonder if they have electricity, okay? Just make any sentences you can, as many as you can, speaking only. You've got one minute for the first four pictures, one minute for the second four. You don't need to write, okay? Just, I wonder, I wonder.
Okay. Would anyone like to volunteer a sentence, just an I wonder, about any of these? I wonder how far the kids walk to school. Thank you. Any others? Great, thank you. I wonder if they have books and pencils, yes. I wonder if they're happy. Ooh, if they're happy, happy. Very good. Yes. Excellent question. I wonder if they have a decent home to go back to after class. Yep. We're going to do the same with these four pictures. Exactly the same. One minute, I wonder. Okay. Okay, anyone like to volunteer an I wonder sentence? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yep, any others? Yes. I wonder if they're more engaged than our students. Oh, interesting question. Yes. Oh, I wonder if they're thinking the lessons are boring. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any other? Yes. If they have the opportunity to play, yes, very good question, yeah. Okay, then what we did after that was we turned all the I wonder sentences into questions, then we categorized the questions. So what category is this? What materials do they use? Do the children have enough books? What's the category? Resources, yeah, or materials. Do they have electricity? What technology do they have? What is the role of technology in this classroom? What's the category? It's just tech, yeah, technology. Don't they get bitten by mosquitoes? Do they always study outside? What happens when it rains? Is this school a boat or an actual school? Does a classroom need walls? What's the category? Infrastructure, yeah, or classroom environment maybe. How many children are in the class? Can children learn if they can't move around? And final category, why aren't there pictures on the walls? Did the students decorate the classroom? Um, I got the teachers into individual groups and they, they took, so one group talked about materials, the other talked about the environment, etc. And then after they discussed their questions, we intermingled the teachers and they all discussed all of these questions. Um, it was a very effective um, kind of lesson and then we finished with them talking about an ideal school and what might it have. I'm just going to show you some of the ideas. An ideal school has amazing resources, so you can see here the school library. What else does it have? Well, someone suggested it should have a garden, a bit like your gardening over there. Um, they suggested the students should have to look after the garden. They would produce fruit and vegetables, which the students would then eat. Another suggested the students should keep chickens and eat the eggs. Another oops, suggested the students should be in charge of decorating the school with murals, uh, mosaics, paintings, etc. There should also be really good free coffee. I'm sure you all agree. And that there should be lots of music in the school. The international language of music 
because obviously that affects a slightly different part of the brain and is a good way of learning. And did I mention there should be really good free coffee? Possibly I did. Um, another suggested, I really like this idea, that at the end of every semester, there should be a performance in English involving all the students. The students choose it, direct it, act in it. And finally, did I mention there should be really good free coffee? <laughs> anyway, the beautiful thing is all of these things already exist in the best schools, don't they? They, they all exist already around the world. Okay, I'm going to move on. There are six categories. The second one I'm going to mention is poetry and literature as a way of bringing issues of social justice into the classroom. I'm only going to show you one poem. It's called an I am from poem. This relates back to the idea that education starts with what the student brings to the class. So this poem is by a very, very high-level non-native speaker who was, was a student years ago. I'm just going to read you the poem. It's called I Am From. I am from the stormy sea and the ceaseless north wind, from endless summer afternoons on the porch. I am from a house with open doors, a yard filled with good memories and fruit trees. I am from the south and from relationships, from grandma's stories on cold winter nights. I'm from Sunday pasta and cafezinhos, from loud discussions at the lunch tables surrounded by loved ones. I am from Jorge Amado stories and geographical differences, from mango trees and white sands. I'm from fragments of my childhood interrupted overnight, from shadows of the past and ghosts of the present. I'm from Laguna, land of Anita Garibaldi, the heroine of two worlds, the fearless woman. I am from Nevis and Bonaza, mountains and the sea. I am from a mix of beliefs, words without translation. I am from the immensity of the world. What do you think of this poem? Beautiful? <laughs> Lots of adjectives. Beautiful, gorgeous, stunning. Thank you. <laughs> Um, where's the student from? Brazil. Brazil, yeah. I'm going to let you into a secret. I like this poem so much that I married the writer. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were a few other reasons as well. But, um, we, we won't go into that. An I am from poem... It, I'm going to show you how, to, how the students do it. They write a list of things that represent their background. So it's not just, I am from Braga, I am from Lisboa. I am from objects, sounds, words, people, smells, tastes and memories, food, for example, sports. Then the students, they choose maybe 10 or 15 of the most vivid of these ideas then each sentence begins with, I am from. So I'm, I'm sure you saw it anyway. Every sentence is, I am from the stormy sea. I am from the house, etc." You can use this with students of any level above beginner. I've used it with elementary all the way to advanced. And as I said before, this is a way of starting with what the student brings to the class. You'll, you'll find it a wonderful tool, I, I promise you, if you use it in your classes. Yes? No. Does the person publish? Oh. Uh, you can write to me later. I'll give you my email address and I'll see if my wife is willing to share it with you in your class. <laughs> No, no, she's not, she's not a poet. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Okay, I'm going to move on. So that's the poem that I would use. Drama. Can you put your hand up if you use drama or role play in your classes? Oh, lots of you. Fantastic. That's great. Um, I'm just going to mention one particular dramaturg um, called Augusto Boal, who invented Theatre of the Oppressed. 
This is obviously related to Paulo Freire's book, Pedagogia do Oprimido, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, Boal, he was a director from Brazil. Um, he had a touring theatre company. Uh, he toured particularly in the northeast of Brazil, uh, the poorest part of Brazil. And Theatre of the Oppressed came about because of a, a particular humiliation for him. He took this play to a very poor part of Brazil, a very poor town. The play was all about a revolution, and it ended with the actors singing this revolutionary song and raising their guns in the air. And the audience was all cheering and shouting and standing up, and at the end, the audience said, can you come with us, the, all the actors, the directors, and their guns, and help us fight against a tyrant landlord who is making our lives hell. And Augusto Boal had to explain, no, we can't. We're just actors. Our guns are not real guns. We're just performing. And so the audience trooped out, very unhappy, because they felt they'd been tricked, that this performance wasn't real. And Augusto Boal never again wrote this kind of play and performed this kind of play because it was too close to the audience's reality for him. What he did instead was he invented something called Forum Theatre. Forum Theatre looks at issues of power and oppression. It's a short play which they perform, then they perform it again and they get the students, not the students, sorry, they get the audience to decide the ending. So the audience chooses the ending. And he did this for several years until what happened? One day, a woman in the audience gave, gave them the ending, but the actor kept getting it wrong. So the woman got up on stage and performed it herself. And at that moment, Boal realized he could dissolve the distance between the actor and the audience, and he invented something called spectators. They were spectators, but they were also actors. Um, he also did a, a load of games exercises, uh, sort of games and exercises to de-mechanize the self. Our, our bodies do, do the same thing again and again and again, and he wanted us to sort of expand our repertoire of action and movement and thought. And all of this came about, uh, he named it Theatre of the Oppressed, because all of the performances were about issues of power. Uh, his work hinges on the two meanings of to act. To act, obviously, is to perform on a stage, for example, but it also means to take action in the world. And so it's those two meanings in his work. Um, I don't really have time to go into uh, everything that Boal did, but I suggest you look at his book, Games for Actors and Non-Actors. His work is not specifically about language, it is about power, but of course the work is adaptable, and I've adapted lots and lots of his games exercises to the language classroom, and I suggest you do the same. Okay, community projects. Let me check the time. How much time do I have? Ooh, 10 minutes, okay, great. <laughs> Community projects. Okay. The methods we can use for community projects are the same as those of anthropological research. So it's things like oral histories, uh, bearing witness, filming, recording, photographing things in the community, measuring and interviewing people. And then obviously we need to transfer it into the English language medium. Also the idea of service learning being useful to underserved communities. So I'm going to show you some actual examples of community projects. Um, a friend of mine from Brazil, Gisele Santos, in, in, in her classes she gets the children to make toys from recycled materials and every Christmas, they make these toys and they give them to children in the favelas and they give a presentation in English 
on what they made and how they made it. So it has that English content, but it's also uh, serving underserved communities. Some of you might know the Hands Up Project. Um, Nick does this in Palestine. Basically, it's drama. Uh, he sends the children plays in English, and they act out these plays. Um, and it's, it's just a wonderful project. They, he sometimes goes over there himself to see the plays. They film them, etc. Final one I want to mention is Urban Chronicles, which took place here in Portugal. Uh, Paul Driver, he got pe his students to go around interviewing people, and then they had to talk about what they did, who they interviewed, and they had to transpose it all into English. So again, they're working with their communities, and then also using what they discover to improve their English. Okay, teachable moments. By teachable moments, I basically mean accidents, things you weren't preparing for, things you didn't expect, but that you can use to teach, and often to teach about issues of inequality or justice. I just have two examples for you today. In Belvedere, Illinois, in the United States, a student, a 12-year-old, looked out of his classroom window and he saw this. And he asked the teacher, where does all the trash go? The teacher arranged uh, a school visit to a landfill site. You know what a landfill site is, right? A landfill is where they put all the trash. The children were so shocked by what they saw, by the amount of waste, that when they went back to the school, they started a recycling project. That recycling project has existed for over three decades. It's still going strong. So it, to me it was an amazing example of what you can do with a teachable moment. You know, this recycling project all began with one question. Where does the trash go? One question, one action, and then one project to make the world better. That, that's really how we change things, isn't it? That's how we change the world, by following through. Second example I want to give you um, this is back in the 60s, might even be the 50s actually, I think it was the 50s, a whale washed up on a beach in the UK and the teacher decided to take the children to see the whale. It was the most incredible experience for these kids. How do children know what a whale is? Well, they read about it in books. They might watch a video on YouTube, but can you imagine being a, an 11 or 12 year old and actually seeing a whale. And then years later, um, Wadsworth wrote this. He was one of the children. He wrote, we looked at it, we listened to it, we went up to it to touch it. It couldn't move much. We ran away from it when it opened its massive mouth. We threw water on it, we made faces at it. We did all sorts of things. From that day on, we all knew exactly what a whale was. What a fantastic piece of teaching just to take the children to actually see the whale. Now, if it had been me as the teacher, I would have questioned, why did the whale wash up on the beach? Was it something to do with sonar disorienting the whale? Was it something to do with pollution in the environment? And I'd have looked at issues of social justice affecting even whales. Okay. My final section is about stories. I'm going to illustrate this section by telling you a story. Years and years ago, do you all remember Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States? He said, he was talking about nuclear waste and he said, every year we produce only enough nuclear waste to fit under my desk. He was wrong by a factor of about a hundred. Anyway, uh, the American government had to decide what to do with all the nuclear waste. They decided to bury it under Yucca Mountain in Nevada. But the issue that they had was that nuclear waste remains radioactive for 10,000 years. They had to warn the people to stay away from this mountain. 
but they had to have a warning that would last for 10,000 years. So they got a linguist called Thomas Sebeok, and they asked him, they told him their suggestions. They said, okay, we're going to put up signs in six languages warning people away from Yucca Mountain. What do you think? And he said, that's not going to work. Signs are going to fall down in the next 10,000 years. And anyway, there are no languages that have existed for 10,000 years. It's not going to work. So they said, okay, how about we put up lots of flashing lights to warn people away from the mountain? He said, that's not going to work. You need a power source and there are no power sources that are going to last for 10,000 years. And they said, what about solar power? And he said, no, you need a solar panel to harness solar power. It's not going to work. They thought of um, inventing a genetically modified cat that would breed and that would glow in the dark to scare people away from the mountain. They would have these genetically modified cats all around the mountain. He said, no, that's not going to work. Uh, the cats are going to go off and breed and they're going to go around the city and it is just not going to work. And so they asked him, how are we going to warn people to stay away from the mountain for the next 10,000 years? His suggestion was that they start an atomic priesthood, that local people, local elders, would spread the legend, the story, that you cannot go near this mountain, and that these priests would then pass the legend on to their children, who would pass it on to their children and their children. Thomas Sebeok realized that the, the most powerful tool we have is stories. It's not technology, because technology, as we know, it changes every year, right? Our phones change every, every year or so. Uh, technology needs power sources. It's, it's going to change. But what doesn't change are stories told over many, many generations. So stories, for me, are the most important tool as a teacher and as a writer. I couldn't teach without stories. Um, Stories, particularly about ordinary people doing interesting things. I'm just going to show you uh, one example activity, six word life stories. Ernest Hemingway, you know Hemingway, yes? He was once challenged to tell a story in six words. Do you think he passed his challenge or not? Yeah. He actually told a tragedy in six words. For sale, baby shoes never worn. That was his story. After that, there was later a, a sort of movement of the six word story. And lots of people wrote into this website. H here are some of the stories that they told. 70 years, few tears, hairy ears. Your, your, your life story in six words. 14 years old, story still untold. One long train ride to darkness. This was a train driver. Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. That was a life story. Never really finished anything except cake. That was her life story. Followed rules, not dreams, never again. And my own favourite, she kissed me and said yes. This is a nice thing to try in class, six word life stories. On that note, I think I'm, I'm almost out of time, right? Let me check the time. Ah, I have 60 seconds. <laughs> Let me stop by finishing with a quick story. Um, a few years ago, I, I had the good fortune to become friends and spend several days with the poet laureate of the United States, Juan Felipe Herrera. Juan Felipe Herrera um, was the child of immigrant farm workers from Mexico. Um, as a child, he spoke no English at all, uh, and his parents would just travel around the country picking fruit uh, to make a living. He went to school, and because he didn't speak any English, he had no friends, and he was stuck in the corner of the classroom in silence. One day, his teacher, a wonderful woman called Mrs. Samson, and I always imagine her as being strong with long hair, like Samson from the Bible. She said to him, Juan, I noticed that you like music. Would you like to sing for us? Now, little Juan Felipe was terrified 
uh, he didn't want to sing in front of the whole class, but she kept persuading him gently. And eventually, he sang for the whole class in Spanish. And she said to him at the end, Juan, you have a beautiful voice. And if we want to know where teaching for social justice begins, I think it begins there, recognizing each individual student and remembering that everyone, they all have a beautiful voice. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Um, here are some key authors. Some key authors you might want to read, and I'll also leave my email address.